Okay, so it's a pleasure to have my children here today. Um, he's uh, from the Curie Institute and uh, Institute Pierre Gilles uh, Duchesne in Paris. And so he did his PhD in 2004 in Paris with Michel Bonnot. And then went to America to work with Andrew Murray. And then we came back uh, to get a position in France and set up his own lab. And he's been working on how cells grow, divide, and migrate uh, using a lot of high level quantitative microscopy. Biomolecular uh, uh, techniques, but also importantly, new tools that uh, like microfluidic tools to uh, be able to manipulate the physical and chemical environment of cells, and um, has done really nice work um, over yeah publishing lots of papers on this and being elected an EMBO member, and also being recognized as uh, with a silver medal from the CM CRMS as one of the top French scientists. And uh, so it's a pleasure to hear today about your work. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you for the invitation. And so what I will do is um, today I have the talk in two parts. The first part is a little bit a summary of uh, things we've been doing in the recent years and that you might know or not, um, a bit focused on the nucleus and deformation of the nucleus. And um, I'll, I'll put some things bit that are ongoing on this aspect. And then I'll switch to a new to a topic that's a bit more new in the lab and I hope might interest you as well, which is the regulation of cell volume and uh, cell size. And with one particular question that I, I like a lot at the moment, uh, because I think we understood something very, very fundamental for, for cell biology, which is how cells are able to grow in mass and volume to the same extent when they go through division cycles. Um, yeah, to, to switch my slides. So, so my uh, our, our initial uh, sort of incentive to to work on these questions. You told me there was a pointer somewhere. With a yeah, maybe you told me, but I forgot. Uh, no, so I think so I should use what for yeah. the pointer on my screen. Yeah, yeah. And okay, if you want to switch. It. Okay. So yeah. Um. Yeah, so uh, an incentive to work on that is, is a bit like shown in this drawing, which is uh, these two cell uh, systems, which are the immune cells and the cancer cells, and how they travel through, through the body when they disseminate, either during an immune response or during a, a development of a metastasis. And one of the common features there is that cells, as they migrate through the body, whether immune or cancer cells, they tend to adopt a lot of different shapes. So this is a, a movie of uh, immune cells uh, migrating the skin of a mice. And then you have a larger magnification image of a dendritic cell in a collagen gel. Uh, you can see these, uh, these branches and this cell is actually actively moving through this gel. And one of the questions we've been asking uh, for many years is how cells sense their shape. So are there are shape sensors and does it, it affect their behavior and their fate? And uh, one of the tools we've been using for that is uh, control of shape using microfabricated devices. So what you see here is a, is a cell that's migrating through a series of channels with a sort of hexagonal shape. Uh, and I just showed this image here because you can see that kind of mimics this branching shape that you see in a cell migrating in a collagen gel, but with a controlled uh, geometry. And here I, I start with this movie that is uh, really not something at the moment we're able to explain in details, but what you see here are a, single, I mean, a lot of single dendritic cells migrating through this sort of hexagonal arrays of channels. They are attracted uh, on one side by a, a chemokine gradient, and the color code is the actin cytoskeleton. So where it's more yellow, red is more actin, where it's more blue is less actin. And you can see the kind of crazy shapes they're able to, to take as they follow this gradient through this sort of maze. And eventually, that's something I'd like to, to understand at some point, uh, but it's not what we have. We are not at this point yet. One thing we've done with a much simpler geometry is just to squeeze cells between two plates. And that already uh, taught, us, uh, taught us a lot of things. And this, the, the motivation for that was really uh, like 15 years ago when I arrived in Paris, Anna Maria Lennon Dumenil, an immunologist there was studying the migration of dendritic cells. And when she was extracting the cells from basically the mice and putting, in, putting them on the cover sleep, they were kind of jiggling like that. So not really motile, where they were supposed to be like the most motile cells 
in the body. And so we, we just uh, squeezed them between two plates and that was enough to trigger a very fast migration. So we did not invent that. That's really something that immunologists were doing for, for a long time. But we uh, just designed a way to do it in a controlled manner so we don't smash the cells and we do it at different times. And, and using that, we, we, we found that actually cells, you can do that with kind of any sort of cell and it uh, and they, you can induce their migration. So that's a, a, a sort of universal response of cells to, to confinement. I can see that my slides are cut, so, but it's okay. Like the, <laughs> the issues with uh, this modern way of doing presentations. And so, um, uh, this is this was since uh, in, this is not our work, so it's all the references to people's papers are cut at the bottom of the screen, uh, and so you cannot see them. So this is from the King Lab. Is a, 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 a guy who is now in Pasteur uh, did that, and he showed that even coanoflagellates uh, can can form this um, can trigger contractility and start to to migrate with this uh, sort of bleb amoeboid migration when they are squeezed. You can see this is a actin, so you can see really something very similar to what we found with cancer cells, immune cells. And so we have this idea that uh, somehow confinement activate, reactivates an ancestral amoeboid migration program uh, that makes cells move in whether or neutrophils. You see this actin uh, labeling of neutrophils moving through collagen. Here you have a, a fragment of a cancer cell. It's also actin in green, also moving through collagen. Uh, you can see that it's very similar. And here recently, you have uh, from a Japanese lab, the Maeda lab, uh, they published in PNAS. This is Xenopus extract. So it's a droplet of Xenopus extract that is being squeezed also between two plates. And you see that they form also these actin waves and this sort of bleb like protrusion, and they are able to move like that. So we, and we, we recently did a, a work that's in Bioarchive where we looked uh, with turf microscopy at the really act in cytoskeleton in these sort of protrusions. And we propose that there is a sort of very simple generic organization of actin that's triggered by when you have an increase in contractility uh, that we call that vector percolation, where the actin filaments are at first clustering together and then being pulled and so constantly depleted. And that form these sort of motile bubbles, if you want, that are very efficient to migrate and to deform through a complex network. So in a in a more um, uh, in a recent work, we 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 were asking uh, how uh, this sensing of shape could trigger contractility in cells, and we found that uh, there was at least one shape sensor that we could identify very clearly, which is uh, the cell nucleus. We did these experiments where we were confining cells between two parallel plates, but this time with uh, an IFM microscope. So recording the force at the same time, and you can see in this graph that uh, as you press on a cell, uh, you, the force increases, increases step by step. Okay, we go micron per micron. So there's always a, a little uh, peak of force here because you need a more force and then you have a fast relaxation. Okay, we are we're studying actually this fast relaxation, but at the moment, I don't want to talk on that. But then after, it's basically flat. So that's exactly as if you were deforming a ball, you know, an elastic ball. You need more force if you deform it more. Except at this particular point where between six and five microns here, the cell was pressed and then the force increased instead of being flat, being the cell was responding to the confinement by pushing back the cantilever. Okay. So this is an active response of the cell. We showed that it depends on the activation of contractility. So exactly the same thing I was showing before when you confine cells, they start to move because you activate this contractility. And what we, we, we discovered is that this is related to the fact that the nucleus of a round cell is kind of folded. It has, uh, you see this sort of shape with this large invagination of the envelope. And as you make it flatter, it needs more surface area to encompass the same volume. So the envelope unfolds until it gets tensed. And then you have a very sharp transition to uh, a tense state. You see it on this movie here. And as soon as the envelope gets tensed, you get a signal that triggers contractility. We propose that these signals come from uh, an enzyme that's called CPLA2 that is sensing uh, membrane tension. This was discovered actually by Philip Nitamer. Um, but you cannot read here. Uh, and there's a very nice work from his lab, very uh, 
much more focused on how um, C play two is activated by memory intention. And we propose that this uh, can form a, what we call the nuclear ruler pathway, a way by which cells can sense the deformation of their nucleus and activate downstream um, uh, behaviors like increased cell migration. So recently we uh, studied this, the effect of this pathway on, uh, in uh, immune cells with uh, the lab of Anna Maria Lennon Dumenil. This work is also on bioarchive if you want to check it. And here, what I want to briefly show on this slide is that uh, in, in these immune cells, I will not discuss, but we can discuss after if you're interested, uh, why this is uh, uh, potentially important for the immune system. Oh, yeah, you have this. But um, oh, maybe, yeah. Nice. Thank you. It was easy. <laughs> now you see the reference. Um, so um, uh, here, the yeah, basically, when the dendritic cells are squeezed and you reach the level at which you tense the nuclear envelope, you can trigger expression of specific uh, genes if you look at longer time scale. And this expression, uh, which is triggered here, is uh, like, for example, CCR7, which is a chemokine receptor, is CPLA2 dependent. And more uh, broadly, I mean, we, we, Anna Maria's lab was able to make a, a, a CPLA2 knockout um, uh, mice. So it's a, not a full knockout, but it's a, here a knockout, a conditional knockout under a, a CD11C. So it's really targeting a specific uh, part of the immune system. And what you can see, so that these dendritic cells are very really CPLA2 knockout. And when they get squeezed, and if you look at the general uh, expression profile. So here you have the non-confined cells. You can see that the CPLA2 knockout and wild type are pretty similar. There's no big difference. When you confine the wild type, you have a big chunk of genes that are induced and some repressed. But if you confine the knockout, there are some changes, but basically it mostly looks like a non-confined cell. Okay, you, you can see that here with this uh, sort of principal component analysis that um, if you look at the non-confined a CPLA2 and white type and knockout, they kind of cluster together. Also, if you induce them with a classical bacterial uh, induction with LPS, they also look like the same. So there's nothing here. But if you confine them, you totally separate them. Okay. So, meaning that really uh, we believe, at least in these immune cells, CPLA2 is a very important mechanosensor. So, there is a whole story after if you're interested in, in this paper about the function of that immune cell. And the idea uh, behind that being that the, when the immune cells migrate in tissues, in their, uh, in, for example, for these dendritic cells, they patrol tissues to look for pathogens. Even when there is no pathogen, they will deform constantly as they migrate. And that can give a signal to the nucleus, a sort of message that will eventually trigger the activation of this pathway to make them migrate to lymph nodes in a, in a non-inflamed tissue. And what they do when they get there is actually bring self-antigens to prevent uh, autoimmunity. So that's uh, the story there. So we also worked on, uh, on stronger deformations of the cells where the cells, for example, have to go through a, a very small hole. Um, and this is something that immune cells are known to be able to do for, for a long time. You see this growing from the early 20th century. Um, and here is uh, just a more modern version of the same thing. You see an uh, immune cell uh, getting into a lymph vessel and the nucleus is blue and the cell is green. And to look at that again, we, we used uh, um, uh, microfabrication. This time is a bit more complex than just 2D planes squeezing the cell. It's a sort of tube which has narrow rings. And when the cell spontaneously migrates through these tubes, you see the nucleus in green. They, they will be able to deform their nucleus to the extent that they really squeeze it through this little hole. Here, the hole is 1.5 micron in weeks. And you can see that this really induces a very, very strong nuclear deformation. So much stronger than what I was showing before by just opening the folds of the envelope. And in this context, we, we unexpectedly found that the nucleus was actually rupturing uh, during this process. So here you have the nuclear envelope on the top, the chromatin in the middle, and the bottom is green and red. And you can see the bubble forming at the, at the tip of the nucleus here. Yeah. Yeah. And these bubbles are not, it's not only a bubble, it's also rupturing. So it's popping open. It's something we were able to, uh, to, to show with a, 
different uh, labeling and that uh, nuclei, when they are deformed, they can get to a level of pressure where uh, they form some blebs and these blebs of the nuclear envelope will rupture. Um, so we, we use a, a, a reporter for this rupture that's called C-gas. It's actually a protein that cells express, uh, but you can also fuse it to, to GFP. And this protein has a cytoplasmic localization. You see it in green in these images. But when um, <clears throat> it also has a very strong DNA uh, binding uh, affinity. So here, this cell has been squeezed. It forms a bubble like that. So this bubble, you see it's black. So meaning there is no chromatin in it and there is no cytoplasm in it. It's basically nucleoplasm. Okay, so the, here you have a nuclear envelope here, nuclear membrane here. And when it ruptures, C gas can enter and it will bind on the chromatin exactly where the bubble was, okay, meaning that uh, basically this whole part of the envelope opened and uh, uh, C gas got access to the to the chromatin. And so if you record that in a cell that's going through a constriction, you can see C gas get, getting access to the chromatin at the tip of, uh, of the nucleus. And what is nice with that is that it also allows you to, to look at, at, at these nuclear ruptures in, in, in tissues. So for example, in this work, we, we were looking at, at the context of tumors. So these tumor cells, even if they don't migrate so much, they get squeezed because there are lots of cells around them, so get deformed. And if you look at in this image, so it's really a slice, it's a human tumor, and we stained it with sea gas. The nuclei are in blue and sea gas is brown. And what you can see is that you see this foci of sea gas on the side of the nucleus, and you can recognize really the same thing I was showing you here, uh, this sort of crescent-like foci on the sort of tip where you have the highest curvature of the nucleus. So very likely these nuclei have been ruptured. Uh, you have several examples on this uh, image. And, and we observed that this is was really mostly in the regions of where the tumor was invasive in the tissue. So that's what we describe in this, uh, in this work. And we, make, um, we were able to make a link between this nuclear envelope rupture and the invasiveness of the tumor via an effect of the rupture on the DNA damage. So basically what we found is that whenever the cells rupture the nuclear envelope, they tend to have more DNA damage. And that is due to an enzyme called TREX1. And this enzyme TREX1 is normally cytoplasmic, but upon nuclear envelope rupture, it can become uh, nuclear and uh, it causes DNA damage. It's an exonuclease that's part of a complex that normally cleans the cytoplasm from DNA for, to fight against viral infection, but also to prevent autoimmunity again. Um, and so, so, for example, people who have TREX1 mutation, they tend to have lupus or so produce antibodies against their own DNA. And, and um, so we were able to show that when you don't have TREX1, you don't get DNA damage upon nuclear envelope rupture. So that was really the main trigger of this nuclear envelope rupture trigger DNA damage. And um, also uh, that this DNA damage was leading to an increase in uh, cell in uh, collagen degradation by these cells by activation of uh, EMT. So it's all in the paper. What, one point I here wanted to mention that was actually we were pushed by the viewers to, to look into that because you know, we had this naive picture that the nuclear envelope ruptures, TREX1 gets in the nucleus, so on, but TREX1 is actually a ER protein. So how does the ER protein goes in the nucleus even the, in the envelope is, is opened and it's not supposed to fully diffuse. So we did this EM uh, work where we were able to confirm that, uh, so if you label both TREX1 and uh, ER protein, so you find them in, in cells that they are all on, they are on the ER indeed. Uh, they are also on the outer nuclear membrane because outer nuclear membrane is continuous with the ER. And if you confine a cell to the point that you rupture the nuclear envelope, you start to find them inside the nucleus. So you find inside the nucleus both TREX1, but also any ER protein, okay? And what's interesting is that they are still bound to membranes, okay? So it really looks like almost is the whole ER that gets in the nucleus. So how can the whole ER get inside the nucleus? Is it because you open and the ER gets in? It's very unlikely. So we did not demonstrate that, but I, I made this little drawing to, to show the idea I have in head with, about how that could be working. And you know that normally, uh, so you have two membranes on the nuclear envelope, you have the inner and the outer nuclear membrane. 
outer nuclear membrane is continuous with the ER. So all these ER mm -hmm. proteins are also on the outer nuclear membrane, but they cannot go to the inner because you have nuclear force that make a diffusion barrier between the two membranes. But if your, your nuclear membranes make a bleb and this bleb ruptures, very likely what happens at the site of rupture is not that you have two membranes which are ending in, in the, like that, they probably fuse together. So they fuse together and they form a pore uh, where there is no nuclear pore. And so any ER protein can then diffuse from the outer nuclear membrane to the inner nuclear membrane. And then you get in a state where you get uh, inner nuclear membrane in the outer nuclear membrane proteins in the inner nuclear membrane, including all the ER protein. And so this, this, the inner nuclear membrane starts to form a sort of ER-like structure inside the nucleus. And this structure has TREX1 on it and this generates DNA damage. Okay. So also explains why it's kind of, why the repair, I know the repair of the envelope is kind of fast, like two, three minutes. Probably there's enough time for diffusion and then going, I mean, fully repairing the whole thing and getting TREX out gets, uh, it takes actually a lot of time because all that has to be re-exported, repaired and so on. And actually it takes hours before the cell is normal again. So the conclusion from this first part is that indeed cells experience large deformations. These large deformations can be sensed and they impact cell behavior and fate. And deformation of the cell nucleus has a sort of deformation threshold uh, with uh, specific outcomes. Uh, so I showed you either tension leading to, to C plate 2 activation, contractility, or rupture leading to TREX1 and 3 and DNA damage. And um, an important physical parameter associated to this nuclear shape sensing is the surface tension of the nucleus. So it seems that really the important structure there is really the nuclear envelope, okay? whether it's fully tensed, ruptured. So, uh, and so we started to get interested in this notion of, <coughs> of nuclear envelope, um, let's say, uh, yeah, uh, state. And here I show you these two, two so that you, you can imagine that it's not only in our uh, cells on our poultry dish in our confiner that we see that. So this is actually a mass embryo from the uh, uh, images from jean léon Maître. And you can see that here you have uh, two types of nuclei at this stage of the embryo. You have the nuclei which are on this outer envelope, which are in blue here. And you have the nuclei which are here inside well, this inner mass in the embryo, which are in red. And if you zoom in, uh, you can see that the outer uh, nuclei are very flat and the, the envelope is kind of very smooth, kind of thing you're used to see when you have cells on a petri dish. But the one inside, you can see that they are super, super folded. They are like totally wrinkled because they're actually round. They very likely have the same volume, but instead of being flat, they're round. So then for the same volume and same surface area, they have a lot more excess of surface area. Okay. And uh, here, yeah, it was just to show also that this sort of deformation of the nuclei can also happen in the context when, uh, when tumor cells are growing. So that's uh, again in the same, the same uh, Nader paper. And here they get actually uh, this flat phenotype and deformed phenotype because they get squeezed at the periphery of the tumor. Okay, while in the inner mass of the tumor, the nucleus are more round and probably less dense. <laughs> so we are wondering what what's the origin of these nuclear faults? And so one thing that uh, people uh, usually, when you do cell culture, so cells are flat and you always see your nucleus more like that. Okay, here, okay, so kind of not, not really folded, but actually if you look from the side, it's because it's kind of flat. But if you plate your cells on smaller patterns, okay, you find that they start to get much more faults. Here, the nucleus is even sort of folded on itself, like a, a crepe uh, folded like that. And actually, and if you do a slice, you can see very well this, this sort of deep invaginations. It's interesting because it, it's not like the nucleus becoming just floppy, like you would have for a balloon. It's really that it has flat part and invaginated part. Okay. So when we started to, to discuss with physicists about what could explain that, they proposed a mechanism that's known in a mechanics nonlinear mechanics uh, of uh, some elastic materials. So that actually the first uh, proposition for that was from uh, Ma Devan, if you know this uh, physicist. He, he did that on a sort of really macroscopic scale. If he, you put an elastic layer uh, bound to 
uh, another uh, uh, to a fluid on top of the fluid and you compress it instead of just making waves it will start to make deep folds okay and so we thought we so there is a whole theory behind that that relates uh what's the sort of fold uh, folding structure that you can make so here's the idea is that you have a, an elastic a thin elastic layer which is a nuclear lamina that is bound to a more softer thing which is a chromatin and there is an excess of the lamina area okay and so that generates this instability and this force and to, to test that we did this experiment where we we confine the nucleus okay so to the point where it's unfolded and then we unconfine it and we look at whether when we unconfine it, we can see this, this instability developing. So here you will see the nucleus being squeezed. So we, the focus will go back up. So, no, okay. And then it will be unsqueezed and you will see that first the nucleus um, oops, <laughs> uh, forms a lot, a lot, a lot of small wrinkles. So it's really this instability. Okay? And then some of these wrinkles disappear. So it, you have again appearance of flat regions while others get deeper, okay? And so here you can see it very well. This part becomes totally flat and this is starting to make a fold, okay? So analyzing this sort of movie, we start to, to really be able to compare that with the theory. And we believe it's really explaining the, this fold is, is, uh, is this mechanical instability because you have this stiff lamina bound to this soft chromatin and you have an excess of the area of the lamina. So the next question I will not answer here, we are, we are working on is why you have an excess uh, area of the nuclear envelope? Uh, why is it, so the nuclear envelope, you know, reforms at, 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 at the end of uh, mitosis. So basically it's reassembled on a set of chromosomes. And so why is there more area put on the nucleus and the, the, the area it needs uh, to be just smooth. And we believe it's really a geometrical uh, question because when you look at when the envelope is formed, it's on a set of chromosomes which are still in the shape of a metaphysate. So it's actually in the shape of a pancake and then the nucleus becomes round. And so you need much less area when you're round than when you're a pancake in a pancake shape. Okay, And that gives you a sort of reservoir of area that the nucleus can use to fold and unfold when it deforms. And so, for example, in these embryos where you have a inner or outer nuclei, they can fold and unfold. And actually the nucleus, the, the embryo even have a sort of raising dynamics because this uh, inner mass, this inner, um, I don't forget the name, uh, vacuole is, uh, is expanding and retracting. And so that can happen without rupturing your nuclei because they have this reservoir of area that they can open and fold, okay? So here I just uh, touch very briefly on um, another question we're working on, which is where the pressure in the nucleus comes from. So I was here talking about the, uh, these folds, but also if we have blebs, it means you have a pressure inside that makes these bubbles, okay? And if you want to understand the pressure in the nucleus, you need to understand a little bit what sets the volume of the nucleus versus the volume of the cytoplasm. There are a few theories that came out, uh, out uh, from different labs, from the Fred Chang lab, from the Sam Safran lab, and also from Pierre Sens and Jean-François Joigny is uh, the work of Romain Rollin. You can check if you're interested. They all basically all conclude the same thing that, of course, it's a mechanical equilibrium. You have an equilibrium between hydrostatic and osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure for the nucleus is because of the nuclear force. So all the small molecules equilibrate is basically the difference of concentration of proteins between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So it depends mostly on import export. Okay. So if you import more, you will swell. If you import less, you will shrink the nuclear volume. And the, uh, the, this pressure, the dorsative pressure depends on the tension of the nuclear envelope. Okay. So that's why actually with this model, you can explain an observation we, we made and other made is that when you deform a nucleus beyond a certain limit, it starts to lose volume. So at, uh, you have a range of deformation here where you deform at constant volume because you open the, the folds. And when you have opened all the folds, if you keep pressing, you will, you will start to behave more like a sponge. So you will press water out. And as you press water out, the pressure, the tension will increase, the pressure will increase, osmotic pressure will increase, and you will start to make bubbles and to rupture the envelope. Okay. 
So with this work, we believe that we have we are starting to get a sort of picture of the different mechanical states of the nucleus, depending on whether the nucleus is more or less deformed. Okay, more like so you have to see that what we call confined is 2D confined. So for example, if you're thinking of cells which are confined because there are lots of cells in a crowded tissue, they will more tend to be round. And so with a round nucleus and with a lot of folds, so non-tense envelope, then if the cell tends to flatten or to elongate or to lose the round shape, the nucleus will start to unfold. Nuclear envelope will reach the point of full unfolding where you have a very sharp threshold to get intensed. That, step, that induces, for example, CFLA2 activation. And if you keep going, you will start to lose volume in the nucleus and increase intranuclear pressure to the point that you make bubbles and you can rupture the nuclear envelope and you get in this state where you can have DNA damage and, uh, uh, and another type of uh, signal that is generated by that. Okay, so now I switch to, to the second part. So the, this first part was a little bit of new stuff with the nuclear envelope holes. Maybe if I have time, I come back to that in the end. Uh, but most of it was a little bit like things we already published and uh, maybe some of you have already seen. This part is, is not published, so I think it will be new for everybody, except people who, who heard me talk recently because that's a talk I give a lot uh, in the recent times. Uh, so is, is this question of uh, cell size homeostasis and in particular focusing on this question of dry mass density. So dry mass density meaning how you ensure that cells have uh, uh, growing in the same extent in, in dry mass and in volume when they grow and divide. So the, you see a lot of people are involved in that. So actually uh, uh, we, we first did the, some modeling for cell volume regulation because of some work of Larissa that I will not really describe that's published also uh, on how cells can change volume when they change their shape. So for example, when they migrate, they can fluctuate their volume and we were very puzzled about that. So we had to understand what really sets cell volume and that was theoretical work from Amit. And then because we had that in hand, this way of measuring volume very precisely, I mean, in this model, um, we were able to start to, to make measures of both mass and volume. I will show you how this was the work of uh, Nishit Srivastava, who is actually now already left the lab and he, he joined a company Altos, uh, so in Cambridge, um, to try to see how this impact aging. And, um, and, and the, the, the models were produced by, by Romain Rollin, he, he has a theoretical uh, theory paper that's already in Biorarchive and it's almost out, I think, uh, in eLife, if you want to check. And then these are our long-term collaborators on cell size homeostasis in, from Italy. So uh, the, yeah, this is a method we have developed a long time ago, not out really of a question, but because, but really more out of an idea of the method uh, that was developed initially by Maël Lebert. Um, who was is the one who invented all the confinement device in my lab. He's now started, uh, he's became an entrepreneur. He started already five different companies. So he's very successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, and, um, but he was also very, very successful in the lab as invented, inventing like super techniques. And he saw that in these confiner devices, uh, if he puts a fluorescent dye, uh, it can use a, cell, a bit like the Archimedes principle that the cells exclude the dye, and so you can get the volume of the cell. Just like if you want to measure the volume of an object with a completed shape, you put it in a glass of water, you just look by how much the water goes up, and that's the volume of your object. You don't have to know anything about the real shape of the object. So that's the same for the cells. And so you can just uh, look at fluorescence at low magnification, and you'll get the volume of your cell by looking how much influence you lose when there is a cell compared to when there is no cell. And a lot of people in the lab have used it. One of the work we did uh, using that is a work where we just recorded cells as they were growing and dividing, and we're able to follow like that um, their volumes with their uh, cell cycle, so the, from birth to division. So one of the things we found is that during division, cells tend to swell. I will not talk about it today. It's a quite interesting observation. It seems to be very, very general also that there is a, a transient swelling during mitosis. But in general, they, they kind of double their volume as you would expect, but they double it in a way that is not so trivial, is not that volume at mitosis is twice the volume at birth, 
but volume at mitosis is volume at birth plus a constant volume. So you can see that if you plot volume at mitosis versus volume at birth, you have a, a, a sort of linear relation, but the slope of this relation is close to one, not close to two. And you have a whole, I mean, it's a whole literature. Is what we were the first to do it for mammalian cells, but it was found before for uh, bacteria and for yeast. They all do that. It's called an adder. Uh, it means that they have some control over the size, but it's not a perfect control. If they had perfect control, they would be sizers, meaning their size at mitosis would be totally independent from the size at birth. It would always divide the same size. And they had no control. If they had no control, they would be what's called a timer, meaning they would just double their size. Meaning, as they go exponentially, that they would tend to diverge in size. Uh, but here, the, the adder is what they do. And for that adder to work, it means there is a coupling between how much the cell, uh, how fast the cell grow, and how for how long they grow. Okay. So this is something that uh, many people have been working on. So basically, if you have cells that grow, so they grow at a certain speed and for a certain time, and if you want them to grow by a given amount, cells which grow slower, they will have to grow for a longer time. Okay. And that's something that we showed in, in, in our work that this is true. And there was some work from especially the lab of uh, Jan Skotheim that showed that some regulation of that. So he had found that initially in yeast and then he showed it worked also in mammalian cells uh, was coming through a regulation of uh, the cell cycle RB by the, an, in, uh, an inhibitor of the G1S transition that gets diluted as the cell grows. And so if all the cells generate the same amount of this inhibitor, um, so the ones that grow slower, they will take more time before they dilute it enough to be able to go through a space. Okay, is a dilution model. Um, but this model really just deals with volume, doesn't deal with mass. Okay, so cells not only have to grow in volume, they also have to grow in mass. So volume and mass are they the same thing? That's the first question you can ask. Okay, for many people, volume and mass are the same thing, especially if you think about mass being the total mass, meaning it's mostly water. So then, okay, volume and mass are almost the same thing. But here I'm talking about dry mass, meaning everything that the mass of everything that's not water in the cell. Okay, no, but that's about 20, 30% of the, the mass of the cell. And so um, volume of a cell is mostly water. Okay, how much water there is in the cell? While mass, dry mass of the cell is mostly proteins. So actually it's proteins and lipids by 70% proteins, let's say 30% lipids, okay? And um, there is no reason for these two things to be the same, okay? Because volume, how much water you have in the cell is mostly depending on osmotic equilibrium. The, the cell is, uh, as a, is, is delimited by a membrane that's lipid by layer that is semi-permeable, meaning water can go through the membrane, but a lot of the molecules inside the cells cannot go through the membrane, luckily, because otherwise they would go out. And so they are kept inside the cells and they are in a certain amount. And there is an amount of molecules also that cannot go through the membrane that is outside. And these two amounts have to equilibrate to equilibrate the osmotic pressure. That's why if you put your cells in a lower osmotic uh, medium, like in pure water, they will swell. And if you put a lot of salt, they will shrink, okay? Uh, while proteins are mostly made by, okay, RNA, then ribosomes, translation, and protein synthesis, okay? So how you couple these two things so that your protein concentration in your cell is, is constant as the cell grows, okay? It's not obvious because these two things don't necessarily have anything to do together. So cell volume is understood for, for quite some time by a model that's called pump and leak. And a pump leak model, basically saying that the uh, volume of the cell is due to the flux of ions. And you have two types of ways ions can go through the membrane, either with pumps, so this is active, this is pump, or through channel, and this is leak. So you can write, there are three equations that from this model, they're actually extremely general. They tell you that you have a balance of forces at the membrane, that you have electron neutrality inside the cell and that you have as many ions going in and going out, okay? And that is giving you the volume, but it's so general that it can give you, I mean, you can have any sort of thing. So what matters if you want to understand that is, is really to put numbers in this model. So the first thing you can do is uh, to simplify things 
by showing with what's called the ponder plot. So if you change your smolarity in the medium, you look at the volume of the cell and you see that the volume change linearly with osmolarity, meaning your cell is a pure osmometer. It is equilibrating totally the osmotic pressure. If you do that with yeast, it's different because yeast has a wall that is very stiff. Um, okay. I'm going forward. I want to go back around. Okay. It has a wall that's very stiff. So the you see, uh, as you increase, uh, as you put the cells in more and more water, the volume doesn't increase linearly because the cell wall is preventing the expansion of the cell. If you remove the cell wall, it will go linearly. So why it's nice to have uh, that, that relation is that you can say that basically the cell is a perfect osmometer. You have an equilibration of osmotic pressure between inside and outside. Okay. So now if you just put numbers, you asking what is outside the cell, I'm considering cells in culture. Of course, if you have cells in a tissue, outside of the cell can be also changing. But if we take the simple case of cells in culture, outside you have basically salt, 300 millimolar, okay? Uh, sodium chloride. But inside the cell, what is inside the cell? There are things that everybody knows. Okay, inside the cell is mostly potassium. There is no almost no sodium, no chloride. And it means there is mostly positive ions and about 160 millimolar of them, okay? A little bit of chloride. But it means that you have the, the rest, which is all the things that are not ions, that are not going through the membrane, which have to be about 120 millimolar of them, and they have to be negatively charged, okay? To equilibrate uh, charges and the smolarity. And then you can write your volume. Your volume basically depends on, um, uh, on this X, Okay, and the ratio between this X and your external uh, the number of ions times the factors that depends on the charge. And this is the, what's called the dry volume. So it's all the volume that is not water. It's what if you remove all the water in the cell, that's what is left. Okay, it's about 30%. And uh, so with that, you have a simple expression of volume. And but then the question is what is this 120 millimolar? And there, that's where mostly people are, I mean, until then, kind of, at least biologists, they usually know these numbers. Uh, then if you ask them, what are these 120 millimolar? They don't know. There are, there are some studies on that. But one case that is very well known and very simple is bacteria like E. coli. These 120 molar are mostly one uh, molecule that is uh, glutamate, okay? So it's an amino acid that's negatively charged. And so basically what you have in a bacteria uh, in terms of molarity is potassium and glutamate. And in uh, mammalian cells, it's a, in yeast, it's also mostly glutamate. Yeah, you have the, and, and in mammalian cells, you have contradictory data. If you look at cell cultures, it's mostly about cancer cells. And again, it's mostly, so in blue, you have everything that is ions, in red, what is not ions. And what is not ions is also mostly glutamate, okay? In general, the other things that are not glutamate are other metabolites, so other amino acids, sugars, these small things, but it's all metabolites. Proteins is almost nothing. So protein doesn't contribute to volume. It's 1% of the molarity in the cell, but it's most of the dry mass. Okay, so that was really, I mean, when you go through that, you realize there is a sort of enigma to solve here that's interesting. So how you, you can make 100 times more protein, it will not change your volume of your cell at all, okay. Um, so we engage in measuring things. Uh, first, we no, the question is really about measuring mass because measuring volume, we already know how to do it. Uh, there is this very sophisticated method from the Manalis lab with a little resonator that uh, changes as the cell passes through a channel inside. They were the first to be really able to measure single cell uh, buoyant mass. So the, and they showed that density in cells is constant. So cells grow in mass and volume to the same extent, but it's very, I mean, they are the only one in the world using this device, basically. It's not super easy to access that. So we, we used a, another technique that's called quantitative phase that's kind of used more and more. And one thing that makes it easy to use that you can just buy a camera that you put on your microscope and that has a grid on the camera and makes a diffraction patterns. And from that, you can get the, the phase shift in your sample. 
And this phase shift is directly direct related to dry mass. I will not discuss it why now, but it's very, very well characterized by, by people. Okay. And so like that, you can measure mass volume of cells in growing cells. So this is normalized cell cycle in time. Uh, so everybody is at uh, zero at birth and at one at mitosis. And um, you can see how it grows in dry mass in volume. It looks a little bit the same. You can see the shapes are not exactly the same. This is uh, then the spreading area. And here you can see the density. So you can see that for most of the cell cycle, density is constant. In mitosis, it changes a lot because it drops uh, because cells swell. And when they exit mitosis, cells lose volume and so and mass starts again. So they, they, they regain density. So they are less dense in mitosis. If you start to look uh, at a uh, growth rate, so growth rate is you take for each single cell the speed at which it grows for, let's say, one or two hours, and you divide by the size it has at that moment. So it's a one over MDMDT or one over VDVDT. You can see that these growth rates are more or less equal during mitosis. Okay. And that during uh, during an uh, interface, sorry, and that in mitosis, they totally diverge. So the volume grows very fast while the mass totally stops growing. And at mitotic exit, mass restarts super fast while cells lose volume. And then they both converge together. Okay, meaning there is, so that already shows you that they are not the same thing. Okay, they can be totally decorrelated. In mitosis, they are totally decorrelated. But then out of mitosis, they converge very fast when cells exit mitosis to get more or less the same value through the cell cycle. So you can also plot one against the other. In mitosis, they are totally uncorrelated. So this is one against the other for single cells uh, at uh, each point in the, in, along the track. And you can see that in interface, they are correlated, but they are not equal. They are actually equal for a certain range of values here. But if the volume grows too slow or too fast, it's not equal to the mass growth rate. So the question is, how can they be coupled? And there was a first idea that came from uh, Romain Rollin, which was very simple, which was to say that one way to couple it is that volume mostly depends on metabolites. Metabolites are made by proteins. And mass and dry mass is proteins. So you could say that the rate at which you make metabolites depends on your quantity of proteins. Okay. So it's not directly the protein that makes the volume, but it's their activity that makes the volume. Okay, so growth rate depends on enzymatic activity. So if you have more proteins, you grow faster. Uh, what is nice with this model is that it gives a, uh, explicit uh, expression for growth rate in mass and volume, depending on variables that are quite simple, like amount of protein, amount of ribosome, things that you can assume to be constant at in different conditions. And so it makes a nice prediction for an experiment you can make. So that's something nice when you have a model like that. Uh, and, the, and this experiment is, let's stop mass production. So you know you can stop mass production. For example, with cyclohexamide, you, you poison the ribosomes. You can do in other ways indirectly by playing on the mTOR pathway. And what, let's say, many people would think is that if I stop to produce proteins, I will stop to grow in, in volume as well. Okay. Actually, the, the model predicts something very different. It says, if I stop to make proteins, I will grow faster in volume, at least for a while, and then I will reconverge toward the lower growth rate. And the reason for that is that if you stop, if you stop <clears throat> sorry, making proteins, you still have the same amount of protein. So you still produce amino acids at the same rate, but you don't use them anymore. So you grow in volume even faster. So we did this experiment, and that's what we found. So if you put... You, we did, uh, we used cyclohexamide, we find the right concentration to not have a mass that decreases, but a mass that stays at zero, okay, for several hours. And you can see that the volume growth rate, which is normally around 0.03, goes to 0.06 almost. And then in five to six hours, it goes down back. Can get the same experiment with an entropy inhibitor. So it looks like this model, at least this is really a very strong prediction of the model that's very fine. So it's very, very convincingly for me showing that this idea that uh, one of the coupling between mass and volume comes from the fact that uh, proteins make uh, metabolites that make the volume might be correct, okay? Now, a second question is whether, uh, what about the growth rate? So here, 
the mass growth rate. So here, basically, it would explain the volume growth rate as a function of the rate at which you make metabolites, so as a function of the, con the concentration of protein. So um, uh, 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 here, we, before going to the mass growth rate, um, I just show you one thing where the, the, the model actually doesn't work, OK? Uh, is, is somehow, if you plot the volume growth rate as a function of the density, so from what I told you, the denser the cell, meaning the, again, it's dry mass density. So denser meaning you have more proteins. If you have more proteins, you make faster the amino acid, so you should grow faster in volume. Okay, so that's very well verified. Okay, and that's actually a very nice prediction of the model. That's a bit, a bit the same as uh, this one from this experiment. Okay, and, and that is is already nice because this is an homeostatic regulation of volume growth rate. Meaning, if you are more dense, you grow fast volume faster, so you dilute. If you are less dense, you grow volume slower, so you get more concentrated. Okay. This is homeostatic regulation already. But what the, what the model predicts, if you make a very simple assumption, which is um, so here uh, that you, you, you have this linear relation between uh, volume growth rate and density here, there is no reason why. I mean, basically, you should go this line here that you see here should go through zero at zero density. Okay. And what we find is that it's nice linear, linear, but it reaches zero for a non-zero density. So there is something here where there might be a limit. That's first bit of limitation of the model. And um, so when, one way uh, to to, to correct that would be that actually, you see this equation here is a volume growth rate that depends on density linearly, but that actually the mass growth rate also depends on density. Okay, then it would not be linear anymore. And so we can, we have that in, in, your, in our data. So we, we measured it. So we plotted the mass growth rate against the density. And we found that indeed, so here is two different types of cells actually. Just you, 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 you really have a very strong dependency of mass growth rate and density, but it goes the other way. Meaning here, the denser you are, the slower you are at making proteins. So that increasing your dry mass. And that's nice also because that's again homeostatic. Okay. Is it the same thing? Is it a different thing? I will discuss that just after. But at least if now you put that in your equations, you get a quadratic dependence of growth rate in volume in density, and you get something that crosses zero at a non-zero value, and that fits super well the data. Okay, so it, with this dependency of mass growth rate on density, you really can explain very well these uh, two homeostatic behaviors that we found from mass and volume growth rate dependent on density. And so what does it mean that mass growth rate depend on density? It means that if a cell is more dense, so has more protein, it tends to make protein slower. And if a cell is more diluted, has less protein, it tends to make protein faster. So that's a bit counterintuitive. I mean, proteins, why when you have more protein, you make less protein and so on. So one possibility is that there is a density sensor, okay? And so to test that, what we, what we did is that we did an osmotic shock where we very fast dilute the cells. And uh, so we put some water on the cell, so not pure water, of course. And so the volume goes up, okay? Then goes down, but it equilibrates not exactly at the same value. So the cells are diluted. And when we measure the dry mass in these cells, we see that the dry mass growth rate increases immediately when we dilute cells. So it means that if you dilute cells, so and you have, they, they have no time to adjust really anything, I mean, it's a few minutes. Huh? Uh, you very rapidly increase the production rate of protein or decrease their degradation, degradation rate, which is another possibility. So one hypothesis was that the, it was a, a, a pathway that's sensitive to density, and the pathway that regulates protein production is the mTORC pathway. So what we did is that we just uh, looked at mTORC pathway activity. So you have reporters for that. You have this uh, uh, kinase that you can, you can uh, look at the phosphorylation level. And what we found is that when you dilute cells, you have an increase in the phosphorylation level of this kinase, okay? Or when you treat cells with cyclohexamide. 
and you, here it's quantified. I'm sorry, it's a bit preliminary, this result, but you can see that you have this increase in the mTOR pathway when you dilute cells. And you can, of course, totally prevent it if you treat with an mTOR inhibitor. So here, I, I'm done with this part. In you, you were saying that I have like four or five minutes. Okay, two minutes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, so so the conclusion of that is that both mass and volume growth rate depend on density in ways which are homeostatic. So basically, you decrease mass growth rate when you are more dense, and you increase volume growth rate. Okay. One feature that's very nice of having two homeostatic mechanisms is that you define a target density. If you have just one, you can, it means you, you balance, but you can go to any density. But here you have two, meaning the only equilibration point is where the two lines cross. Okay. And that's exactly so where volume growth rate and mass growth rate are equal. Okay. And so we checked if we have. A sign of a homeostatic density and the target density. So homeostatic density means that cells that are born light, uh, less dense at the end of the cycle, they become more dense and, and vice versa. But more interestingly, we really found that there is a target density, meaning that if we plot the change in density over few hours on a cell as a function of this density, you find that it's as this decreasing a curve and that is crossing zero here at a specific density that is the uh, target density of cells. Okay, so that's defined by the point at which these two lines cross that I showed before. And you can put all that in some simulations. I will not explain well uh, that, but what is very nice with that is that actually you have to see that this correction mechanism is slow because it act, it's acting on, at the speed of growth of cells, which is very slow. Okay, so it's modulating the growth speed. So if you have a, a sort of spread of density at birth, and I did not explain that, but you, you remember I showed you at the beginning that during mitosis, mass and volume are doing totally different things for, for a number of reasons. So cells are usually born with a kind of spread of density that's actually taken directly from the data. During a cell cycle, you just have time to converge a little bit, and then you respread, then you reconvert. And what it gives you, is not that you really always reach this target density, but you maintain your cell population in this range of density that you are. Uh, so, so basically, which is how much you are able to, con to converge in the cell cycle time versus how much you have diverged during mitosis. Okay, and so you do these oscillations in, in this convergence, divergence of density that we find experimentally, and you can reproduce with a simulation. Okay. So uh, in conclusion, cell volume and cell mass are not the same because volume depends mostly on uh, so water contents on ions and small metabolites, mostly amino acids, and mass, dry mass is mostly proteins. But they are coupled because amino acids are synthesized by protein and it couples volume growth speed to density. And mass growth rate depends on density. We don't know exactly how it works, but we suspect it's because mTORC is sensitive to density. mTORC pathway is sensitive to density. Voilà. Uh, so I think I will stop here. Okay. Uh, and I hope you kind of got a bit of that. For me, it was a very nice journey. I didn't know at all this question. <laughs> and uh, I must say, I, I really, I, I think it's a very, very fundamental question that people tend not even to ask themselves how you grow in mass and volume to the same extent. It's actually a real question. And I think here, yeah, at least we put the first tone, which is, okay, there are mechanisms in cells that couple mass and volume. There actually, we found at least two. Uh, one which is regulating volume growth rate, the other mass growth rate. They are not the same at all. One is a sort of purely physical mechanism, if you want, the volume growth rate regulation. And one is seems to be a sort of sensing pathway for mass growth rate. So thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, I skip that just to get to the enrichment slide. This is a lab already some time ago, but uh, you have a lot of the people who did the work I showed were still there. Uh, and uh, we, we are looking for new members for our nice night. Uh, the lab is called Bio6 for some historical reasons. So it always makes me think of these heroes of my childhood. There were five, but they were called Biomen. Uh, and so if you want to become a bioman or a bio woman, you can join our team. And thank you for your attention. Thanks.
for the very first time. The um, density dependence of your, so you show that the um, mass uh, growth rate depends on the density there. And it's so quick. Do you think that inside this methane mid end part, there is also some like essentially viscosity regulated? Yeah, so, so there are this really a bit the hypothesis. Uh, of course, I mean, if you know a bit, maybe you know a bit the literature in this field. Uh, no, but you made the right idea. So there are actually two, two other contributions uh, that, that are a bit uh, suggesting uh, things in that direction that are alternative possibilities. One is from uh, Morgan de la Rue and I am old, where they showed that when cells get denser, you have a reduction of diffusion of, a number of big molecules. Okay, That's what people call crowding effects. Okay, because the cell is already quite dense, so big molecules don't have a lot of space to move. And especially ribosomes, they take a lot of space. So if you reduce a bit the amount of water, so if you have too many ribosomes, let's say they will kind of fall on each other and things will have a hard time to diffuse. So if diffusion rate goes down, uh, protein production rate will go down. Okay, But we believe that, I mean, from what Morgan showed, he did it mostly in, uh, in yeast, but it's really at much higher density that this effect will happen. He has to do hyperosmotic shock on cells to start to see that. So probably in normal cells, you are not diffusion limited. And another one is viscosity. There is a, actually a Barakaf paper. Now I forgot uh, the name of the lab who did that, but they did that on, on, on uh, Xenopus extracts, which is nice because they can add stuff or they can add protein and stuff. So the, the, they see that there is a modulation of, of growth rate that is also kind of seems to be related with viscosity effect. Uh, so that would be a more like really purely physical effect. But to, we had that in mind. That's why we tried mTORC. And then I don't see how, um, I mean, why mTORC would be important if it was a purely physical effect. And we see that if we, uh, uh, I didn't show these results actually, but if we perturb the mTORC pathway, we lose totally the mass uh, coupling with density. So we see we think the mTOR pathway is also, but why is the mTOR pathway is density sensitive is uh, density sensing maybe so by yes, some of these mechanisms. And I was just told that it's yeah, ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks again.